Are you curious what literary agents are really looking for when it comes to platform? Or are you sharing a little bit about some of your book's big ideas on social media and you're a little worried that maybe you're sharing too much and it might jeopardize the interest the agents have in your project? Are you wondering what to really focus on when crafting your book proposal? Well, I have literary agent Lucinda Halpern on the show today, and this conversation is packed with ideas for how to get your book noticed. I'm Ann Croker, writing coach, and on this show, I help writers improve their craft, pursue publishing, and achieve their writing goals. Today, I have New York-based literary agent Lucinda Halpern on the show. Lucinda Halpern is a literary lecturer and PR agent with over 15 years experience on both the corporate and agency sides of publishing. As owner of Manhattan-based literary agency Lucinda Literary, her roster of authors includes New York Times bestselling authors Susan Pierce Thompson, Chris Bailey, Kate Flanders, Paul Jarvis, the new work of Nicola Krauss, and Jake Wood. In a marketing and publicity capacity, Lucinda has worked with New York Times bestselling authors Stephen Dubner and Stephen Levitt of Freakonomics, Gretchen Rubin of The Happiness Project, Ben Mesrick of Bringing Down the House and Busting Vegas, and many more. Let's dive straight into this conversation with Lucinda, and I think you're going to feel more confident than ever as you prepare to pitch. Lucinda, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Anne. Wonderful to be here. Yeah, I'm just really, really excited to introduce our listeners and let them have a glimpse of what it's like to interact with an agent. So I'm going to give you a a quick and easy question to start out with, just because I feel like, oh, surely you have a a favorite. What is your favorite book of writing that you recommend to your writers, those you represent or anybody you're talking with? Sure. So there's a great book that is uh, little known. I would say it's, it's so hard to choose, right? There's Bird by Bird. There is a book by Brett Anthony Johnson, who is formerly creative writing director at Harvard. I fell in love with his novel. He wrote a second book called Naming the World, which I love. The discipline of being a writer. You just have to sit every day but in the chair. There's a wonderful book I have on my bookshelf here called Writing Like Tolstoy by Richard Cohen. He just has a wonderful sort of historical rendition of how all of the great writers wrote. Uh, And recently um, I read Anne Patchett's um, This is the Story of a Happy Marriage, which is about her sort of memoir and also tips for writers. And I found that to be just incredible. So four books for you. <laughs> that's that's awesome. I love it. People can expand their uh, their library of books on writing. That one about reading writing like Tolstoy. Is that what you said was mm-hmm. the name of it? How to I'm write not, like Tolstoy. How yeah. to write like Tolstoy. I, I'm not familiar with that, but I'm thinking it could be a nice compliment to George Saunders' book, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain. Are you familiar with that book? No, oh, I, I haven't read it, but this is the beautiful packaging of Tolstoy. Which of it's was gorgeous. Perfect. It's uh, gorgeous. Oh, that's a great idea to, to get people ready to write and a lot of coming at it from a lot of different angles. Yeah. Thanks for your tips. Well, I, we have so many different kinds of writers who tune in to the show, but a lot of people are working on nonfiction. So even though you represent both novelists and uh, authors of nonfiction, I thought maybe it would be interesting to, to talk a little bit more about the world of pitching and querying nonfiction work. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yes. But you see proposals every day and you know how to represent those when you go pitching publishers. So we're dying to have a little bit more insight here. And I think most people know by now that they need, if they're going to work on a nonfiction book, they know they need a nonfiction book proposal. Mm -hmm. And that is what you have to have in order to start the process because you're going to be querying and then you're going to hopefully hear some interest from the agent. And then you'll be sharing the book proposal with them with some sample chapters. So again, here's a simple question, but how many sample chapters do you like to see in a proposal? Mm. So interestingly enough, most nonfiction book proposals we've sold have been without sample chapters. What? Um, Which is like a sort of, like it feels um, like an embarrassment of riches that (laughs) that we've been able to do that because that overview, which we can talk more about, is just so important. And the crucial decision makers who are deciding whether they buy a book or not are not often reading all of that sample material for something like 
a business book or a popular science book or health lifestyle book. So that's just sort of an interesting kind of, you know, inside the trenches, you don't always need the sample chapter to sell a nonfiction book proposal. And there's a famous story of Simon Sinek walking into a room with his then publisher and getting the book deal on the spot based on his TED talk. So that happens too. But to answer your question, I, you know, I like to see one to two sample chapters. And what I don't like to see is someone who sends me their entire manuscript, especially in the category of business or prescriptive nonfiction. I don't know what to make of that as an agent right away because I'm really looking to develop something from the ground up with someone. And so much is going to change about that later manuscript after we do the roadmap together of the book proposal. So light on sample chapters, I would say, and really spend your time on that overview and that bio and that marketing section, the other pieces. Which a lot of the writing style and the writing voice could come through in those places and should come through in those places, even as they're pitching the concept itself. So they should get an idea of how you write by looking at that if you've done it well. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of the way that you present a book in a saleable way is happening in those spots. Do you have any ideas or tips that they can start to begin thinking about their big concept, their big idea for their book and how to best present that? I mean, I, that's yeah. kind of asking a lot. Or- uh, no, no, no. I think, I think what's most instructive sometimes is to give an example. And I noticed that you had um, one of our uh, beloved authors, Ron Friedman, on, on your program. And I recommend that anyone listening to this go back and listening to, listen to his segment on Decoding Greatness. So what Ron does so well is the elevator pitch for his book. So, I mean, I can recite it for you. It's that we've all been taught that there are two paths to greatness, practice and uh, talent, but it turns out that there is a third path that we don't know about. And that's the subject, it's, it's called reverse engineering and that's the subject of his uh, latest book, Decoding Greatness. So that is so succinct. That is so surprising in its thesis. And it's something that an editor or an agent can just get behind and say really quickly on the phone and elicit interest. So when you're thinking about your big big idea, I actually sort of counterintuitively suggest that you begin small. What is the most surprising element of what you have to say? So, you know, here's a sign that you're onto a big idea. It hasn't been done before. And every, you know, they, they say in the music industry, for instance, that no hit song is, is a new song, right? It's always like a, it's a different spin on something popular and proven, extremely similar in the book world. So that big idea should have sort of a, a landscape of, of popularity of hunger around it. And then you you present your unique pivot. Tell me what you mean more about that hunger around it. Say more about that. So um, again, I can give another uh, client example of that. If there's something that is, you know, in the, it, it's a trend, right? It's really like the simplest way to think about it is a trend. And publishers are trend casters. They're, future, they're futurists. They have to think about books from the perspective of what is going to sell when the book publishes in two years, and then for five years after that, because they're interested in books that backlist. So ones that have that perennial potential. So writers should be really savvy to what are the sort of trends that are happening in the media or on podcasts or Netflix series, cults, for instance, like I represent a cult memoir. Why was I interested in that writer? Because it was a very fertile category and there were readers who are hungry for this kind of content. Uh, I represent Kate Flanders, as you mentioned, she wrote a, a wonderful bestseller called The Year of Less. When she came to me with her idea, we were just at sort of like nipping at the heels of the trend of minimalism. And we could place her book idea in that category of there's this new generation and they're all interested in being minimalists. And there's this hashtag about van life. And, you know, editors love to see sort of things like that, that speak to the the, the trends of the day. So then that points to comps. It's got to yes. be uh, a lot of deep looking into comps because the comps, and for those who are listening and don't know what I'm talking about, comps are what? You can tell them. So comps are comparative titles um, or competitive titles, that however you uh, define it. Really what editors and agents are looking for in comps are ones that have published in the last two years with a number of Amazon reviews and within a ranking of 10,000. So in, in an ideal circumstance. So what does that signal that there's really been popular, you know, sort of acclaim and response to this book? And the book industry, like the Hollywood industry, is a lookalike business. It's 
does this book like it look like three other titles that Penguin Random House has published successfully? Yes. Okay. Well, let's put together a PL that suggests how many sales that we can expect based on those titles. And there's always a you know a magic and a gamble to it too. It book book buying is not a straight science. I, I wish it were, but it isn't. It's you know, is there some new element that we can get readers excited about, which would merit sort of the higher advance based on what we've what we've seen from our PO. So uh, comps, comps, comps all day long. They should be in your pitch letter, they should be in your overview, they should be in your elevator pitch to an agent. Everyone gets more excited when they are anchored in the bestseller that your book could be. So even though the bestseller may be by a person who's established, they're already famous, if you were writing in the world of fantasy and you say, you cite the hunger games, that's yeah. not, you're saying that's okay. Because well, I know a lot no. of people <laughs> advise that to. Okay. Yeah. So, so my advice is to really be, it, it's a combination and it is an art, you know, you should try to find titles that are popular, but not like Brene Brown, you know, not Glennon Doyle, because if you're, if you're starting out and you don't have that kind of platform and you haven't published before, it's really hard to make that case to a publisher uh, or an agent. So you know, really just go by, this is what editors do too. They go into Amazon and they search the key words that your proposal has and the key themes. And sometimes they find books that they're not even familiar with um, that seem to have really performed. And then they dig over, they dig around, they do their research. If you're really well read in your category, which is one thing I wanted to emphasize to writers who are listening, if you're not reading, you shouldn't be writing. Like you need to be well read in your category to prove why your your book is is different so you want to dig around and you want to sort of use comps to prove your unique sort of slot on that shelf so if there's something unusual about the uh, something some element of your book and you're in a certain genre but there's another book that's it can be fairly well known and something about the structure or its approach is an easy way to quickly with shorthand explain something about your book is that going to create confusion because it's outside your genre or is that going to create clarity because you've given an easy way for them to picture what your is happening at this in this element of your book I, I say the latter i think that's like a wonderful thing to do i encourage that writers and their pitch letters be really specific about the characteristics that are similar so if you're going to use glennon doyle's untamed which every memoir writer comes to me saying, I'm going to be the next Glennon Doyle, um, then you really should have sort of the, the evidence for why, like I'm going to tell my book in the format of, or I share a voice with, or, you know, there, there have to be other more specific characteristics than just saying my book is going to be hers. The other thing that's sort of surprising about comps is that you can use other media forms. So I personally, and editors love this as well, love to see based on the success of the podcast XYZ serial, you know, I have developed a fantasy series that is, is, you know, in the same genre or um, based on the success of all of these Netflix series X, Y, and Z, because readers are digesting content across formats, right? You know, that was another point I wanted to raise with you on the marketing front about can't just think about book readers anymore. In the same way, think about comps expansively. It's, just, it's suggestive of that hunger that we were talking about. What are people looking for most in content? It needn't be books specifically. That's really good. And, and that's very applicable. I mean, they can take that. That's actionable. They can put mm -hmm. that in there. Mm -hmm. Put that in their proposal. And I loved how you said to pepper the comps throughout the document. That's a great tip. Yes. Thank you for that. So when they're looking at their comps and they're doing they're in the comps section trying to highlight these books, how many should they spotlight? So if you're in your overview, I would say two to three, you don't want to overwhelm, right? Then then an editor's focus is all over the place. And in the actual comp section, you could aim for more, you could aim for five to six. But again, using that all to say, here's why mine is similar, but different. Yeah. Yeah. I have a whole, I have a template and I have a whole training program and that is exactly how I have it set up. And just really clearly it's similar in these ways and different in these ways. So I think that that's, that's aligning with what I've been hearing. I'm so glad to hear you confirm it. Yes. And, um, and I think that marketing thing that gets me thinking about the big word that every author gets frustrated with, but is inevitable. And that is platform. Hmm and how we need to be able to present to you an agent. And then you would then in turn show that to the publisher 
platform numbers. And you talked about a PNL. Some people might know, not know what a profit loss is. If you can just quickly explain that, just to clarify that. Sure. No, it just means that they're actually running a sort of spreadsheet in, in house, the editors who are thinking about acquiring a a book for what can they expect to profit on this book and then what are the expenses associated that they can lose and then that net number comes out with what they're able to offer so and what are they what kinds of things are they plugging in to that uh, for for profits it would be really set it would be sales you know whether you're thinking book sales or whether you're thinking um, subsidiary rights like foreign licenses that they've sold against the book and audio rights all of that sort of goes into the computation of how much profit the book generated and then losses would be what they have to spend on a book so the marketing the co-op for placing that book in, in amazon or bnn the design and packaging of that book um you know it'd be interesting it's like i'm, I'm spitballing here but, you know as a business owner myself i know what a pnl is but i haven't actually looked at it. editors don't give agents access to their pnls so i'm just you know sort of imagining what those what those things could be that they're looking at well i would assume that part of it would be the platform of the author so based on the numbers i'm seeing here they probably can move this much product yeah. and but based on the email list or their reach on social media or maybe they have an asset like a podcast which you know we're on right now something like that so i think that's probably enough for them we don't need to get into the the weeds on a profit and loss statement or the process but i am thinking it's maybe a segue to talk about platform mm -hmm. platform numbers and then how they might then also think about leveraging some of that for their marketing of the book and other marketing you know, efforts that are unrelated to their platform. Yep. Yep. So let's talk first a little bit about platform. Yep. If you're willing to, would you just tell me a number? Like I know nobody wants to get hemmed in, but like when can an author know that he or she is ready to come to you with her query, with the, with a, with a pitch, whatever opportunity they have with you, where do their numbers need to be for before you can even take a look? You're going to get different numbers from different agents. I also like to say that it differs for category and for the particular author that you are. So someone who's a PhD or a doctor or a finance professional or a psychologist, or you know, there are a number of sort of more private industries where an editor is going to recognize your life has not been tweeting right like this is not who you are whereas you're a journalist it's going to be what are your like how many bylines have you accumulated and what sort of publications and what is your twitter following how many people actually know who you are uh so i just want to you know if you're a business person and you find that you run a successful company maybe again you're not so active on social media but you have a youtube um, channel that gets views and you also have a massive email list which publishers are more interested in than social media numbers so i'm just giving you a sense of the diversity in the non-fiction non-fiction sphere alone that we're evaluating platform on there is no one number now oh come on <laughs> i know but i'm going to give it to you i'm going to give you my i'm going to give you my ideal number to see um and and really i think if you are an expert meaning you're you're an expert by way of uh by popularity and not by way of credential then editors are really looking for numbers into well into the thousands. You know, 10,000 is really where I want to see you be before you even contact an agent. 10,000 on one platform, your email list, your YouTube channel, your Instagram following. And beyond that number, I want to see engagement because there's obviously a lot of people who sort of, you know, you can never really fake these services, but people do put enormous investment behind their social media. If they don't have an engaged community and editors really looking for that too. So, um, Thank so you. that's really <laughs> only for the experts among us, not for right. those who bring other sort of credentials in the writing or business space. That's a great distinction. And I appreciate yeah. that. How about novelists? Uh, just briefly, do you feel like um, that I'm hearing more and more, they need some sort of reach into readership? Uh, yeah. is, what do you, what's your, yeah. where do you stand on that? So, I mean, every writer, so, you know, as you know, Anne, we offer a number of events and courses and every writer comes to us with the marketing question, right? <laughs> like it's always, I'm starting out or I'm, I'm concerned I don't have the numbers and how do I get there? And these are novelists as, as, as well as nonfiction writers. Novelists need to focus on getting their writing out there, their voice and their writing. Is it beneficial if they bring an Instagram platform 
25,000 people? Yes. Is it necessary? No. Their work is evaluated really on the page. You know, you can have a complete unknown come out there and be the next darling of the literary world. That's how many successful novels are born. So it's not a metric that is as important as important in uh, fiction. Very helpful. Very helpful. That's very clarifying because I, I think, you know, we're hearing some trends in the other direction, but this is really reassuring. So when they're, when, when a nonfiction writer is trying to work on their big idea, their big concept, you did a couple of things. One of the things you said was that you like to develop the project with the author. So now we've got this confusing, I think, not knowing when to come to you if they have the idea, but if it's not ready, because you're going to work with them. Tell me what that looks like if you're going to be developing a project that they've already developed, or should they come to you at a different point? So honestly, if you're going through the, the proverbial slush pile, the inbox as of agents you're blind querying, you should have as much of that material developed as possible. Like, I don't really want to receive a query letter about your book idea, and then you say to me when I request it, I don't actually have a book proposal. However, if you're referred by an author in our network, you know, which is really how the majority of agents are finding their clients, which is why I always say get that six degree of separation connection to an agent, just because there are so many blind submissions coming at you, better to have, you know, an in, a step up if you can. So if someone is referred to me and they just have an excellent sort of profile and they have the germs of a big idea, I will not require that they have a book proposal already developed to take them on. Is it a bonus, especially when my pipeline is really full and I just need to sort of be thinking about how I can work with that person effectively? Yes, always better to have the book proposal, but I'm going to tear it apart. <laughs> like I love it. A ruthless editor, love to get my hands wet. Everyone on my team at Lucinda Literary is. It's like why we got in this business. And, you know, we're trying to work and collaborate with you on what does the market want? How do we make this the most commercial? Usually that's a really wonderful sort of asset that agents bring. Absolutely. If, if a writer can kind of just let go of their babies, like, you know, the darlings and let you yes. work on finding the, what's really working, hone it down, man, you're going to, you're going to position them for success. That's exciting. So if somebody's trying to get that six degrees of separation from themselves to an agent and they're living in the middle of nowhere and they've have an opportunity, which is social media, mm -hmm. they can connect by following and liking and interacting in the comments of something that somebody like you might create. I know you're very active on social media, almost all the channels, all the big ones. If they do that though, or, I know a lot of writers, I work with a lot of writers as clients and they're like, oh, I feel so silly doing that. I sure, give them, no, I, I give I, them an answer, but you give them an answer. It was on my list to bring up and just a note on social media. I am as social media phobic as they come. And the reason that I recently forayed into that is because that and building an email list and really going through this arduous process of learning how to market is what's going to help me guide my authors better in that way. Um, so I'm like learning this step by step on the ground with my with writers who are doing the same. And um, to answer your question, yes, there are all of these different avenues now. So back in the day, honestly, before I even uh, started my career as an agent, people were mailing physical manuscripts to agents' offices, and there were interns, you know, reading these things. And now it's, we're in an email world, like you've got to capture people with a subject line. So if you can't break through someone's spam filter or gatekeeper or, you know, agency slush pile, absolutely, you should turn to social media as a way to sort of short pitch your book. Is it uncomfortable to do it publicly in an Instagram comment? Yes. But like, what do you have to lose here? The business of writing is business of rejection, and you've got to sort of get out there and swallow your fear. And if you know that, if you believe in your book, and know it will find a home, there is no avenue you shouldn't try. My assistant gets LinkedIn messages with people, hey, can I, you know, query this? And when that happens, I'm probably giving away, I'm about to face a flow of LinkedIn messages from out of this podcast. But when that happens, she comes to me and says, do we know this person? Do we want to look at this, right? So it's sort of, it's a, it's a good way in. And, and you and I connected through Instagram. So this is a great way to find contacts. Another way, if you don't, if you literally cannot think of a single author friend you know to ask, can I get a conversation with your agent? You could write, you could write an author you admire, not, you know, not the Tom Clancy's of the world, someone who sort of has a lower profile, but a book that you love. 
And you could get into a dialogue with that person. And at the right moment, you could ask for an introduction to that person's agent. I know that these are sort of tougher strategies for new writers starting out, but as an agent, this is what we do all, all day long. We hustle, we network, we're tenacious as hell. That's how I you know, suggest writers behave as well to get their work published. There's a lot there. And I know there will be some shy writers who feel like that just feels so Hard. Uh, invasive maybe. And they feel funny about doing that, but I, you framed it so well. The the belief in your project, like do whatever you can to get it out there. And, you know, I'm thinking if you can articulate it in that one sentence, that elevator pitch or less, you know, really it's the hook. If they can hook you, yes. then that's actually good practice. Even if the person shows no interest, you actually are practicing your hook over and over again, which is also a good skill. Yes. That's exactly right. Even so, in the closing of a query letter, I'm sorry to interrupt you for a minute, but you know, I know that writers are always interested in like, what are the errors that you see in query letters? And too often I see this sort of passive, like, please let me know if you'd like to receive my proposal. That can work if your if your pitch is so strong and compelling, I've got to pick it up. But if you add a sense of urgency around it, like you know, you're one of a, a very few agents that I'm querying. And so if you could let me know your reactions as soon as possible, you know, that's one tactic for the more gentle among us. That doesn't require being invasive. Or, you know, I have several meetings scheduled with agents. I've gotten a number of requests. Uh, on the heels of this article that just published, I think now is the time. I'm envisioning this publication. I mean, there's so many different ways to be a little more forceful in how you close your query letter or pitch than just sort of passive about it. You got me thinking about two different things at the same time. So let me see. Well, I'm going to ask about the, the project itself. How can we know if our project is too niche? Because I know people like to go, they like to either pack everything they know into one book and it's too big, too sprawling, but then you have them focus so much. Sometimes it can get too niche because they keep hearing niche down, niche down or niche down. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. What's How can we know if we've gone too small? Yeah. So that's a great question. I think the first place to look is comps, you know, do your research. Like what are the comps telling you? Well, there have been five books about this, but nothing that's ever been what I'm trying to say, which demonstrates that there's an audience. The second thing I recommend is find your personal audience. If you can't prove that audience, whether fiction or non, to an editor, and yes, platform is, is definitely the way we, we look at that, right? But it, it's, I've, I've tested this with a focus group. You don't have to put it into that sort of businessy language, but it, it's like the response that I'm receiving when I give events, events the Number one question people are asking me after I give a talk. This suggests that you have road tested your concept and that there is response. So the book writing trade, you're thinking about your reader first and foremost. You're not thinking about the story that you want to personally get out there for your own catharsis or your legacy or your mother. It's about like what readers are telling you they want. And so being demonstrative of that in your pitch to agents and editors is just so important. And I'm, I start to pay attention when someone tells me this is what I hear time and time again in my 10 years of practicing X. So good, because this is going to lead up to a question I have about the um, how much are writers allowed? How much are they allowed to put out there prior to pitching a book? Because this is, this is a huge question, comes up all the time. If I publish some articles or blog posts or podcast episodes and I talk basically speak the essentially the same information that would be in a chapter is the publisher going to say, well, you already published and totally not interested. Or are they going to say, wow, you really validated your idea. Cool. Let's go forward. And talk about that a little bit about how much is too little, how much is too much or how to handle that whole delicate sure. balance of so in content generally, like you have a blog and you've already talked about this a lot. Is that what you mean versus a self-published book? Not a self-published book. I'm talking about just it, it, sort of testing your ideas. Like yes. how yeah. can we test them in a way that is not basically sending the book out in advance or is that okay? I think that the rule of the day is like the more free content, the better. You know, the more, um, and and one of my authors, uh, Paul Jarvis, had a really wonderful way of putting this, teach everything you know. And I, I really believe in that so much. I'm sort of getting shells as I repeat it. I believe in that so much and editors believe in it too, because again, if they see that audience clamoring for your ideas, there are so many books that are based, you know, just a repurposing of existent content. So 
that's a that's a huge draw. There's a big mistake, and again, I'm just I'm focusing on nonfiction. If you're a fiction writer, you don't want to throw your whole story out there, right? Yes. But um, I, you know, if you are again proving the audience for your content, there is a a way of repackaging it as a book. And many of those readers, I mean, the belief is because the data is that those who digested your content online free or in a podcast are going to buy your book. So it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter that they've seen it before. It's better. They've seen it before. Boy, that aligns with um, Ryan Holiday's perennial seller. He has a whole chapter about that, that we tend to, to hesitate to give away when giving more free content out actually benefits in the long run. So I just read that. I just happened to read this. Leave us with an encouraging word, you know, give us, give us a little vision for what's, uh, what we should be focusing on with our work, especially let's, again, let's kind of focus in on nonfiction authors. Leave us with a, leave us with a little send off to feel good about what we're doing. I mean, I am all about encouragement and motivation. Like I just think there's way too much doom and gloom that new writers are, are hearing as they enter, you know, as they're standing at the gates of publishing. So I always often say like, it doesn't matter where you're based. You know, people say, I'm not in New York. I'm not connected to the industry. As you and I just discussed in this interview in our virtual world, there are lots of ways to connect with agents and with authors and, you know, to really, or, or just starting to do more content online. These are all ways to get your name out there. So when there's a will, there's a way. If your book is so powerful and so needed, you will find the right home for it. But before you just think that in your own head, you road test it. And and that's getting, I always say, go to your most skeptical, trusted friends, right? Like let them kick the tires of what isn't working about your idea and let them say to you, this isn't new. I've heard it before. You know, what, what's your, what's your new spin? Like what are, what is additive about about the literature that you're presenting to the world. So it's really that combination of like doing your homework first. And then once you know that it's, it has real potential, just beating the bushes to get it out there. Thank you, Lucinda. How can people best stay in touch with you? Oh, great. So um, our website, lucindaliterary.com. And uh, we have a newsletter we send every week on Thursdays. It's full of value-driven content, tips for writers, secret strategies, interviews with film people, you know, it's all sorts of um, content. And, you know, as you know, and we offer now, a, you know, a ton of events for authors and coaching programs for writers and courses. So the website is definitely where, where to find me. That sounds great. And this is different from being agented by you. This is just no, like educational. Is, you'll find everything on our website everything we do, how to query us. We have a number of really wonderful agents who are actively building lists at Lucinda Literary. So please go to our submissions page and see what they're focused on and definitely check out all of the different resources we offer for writers. Fantastic. Thank Thank you so much for your time today. A treat to have you. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. You can access everything related to the interview at annkroker.com slash Lucinda Halpern. Lucinda has a gift for you. It's her essential guide for writers. The guide is called The Six Things Every Book Pitch Needs. The instructions for downloading that are at anncroker.com slash Lucinda Halpern. Let me know your best takeaway from this interview and be sure to subscribe so you'll be alerted the next time a video goes live and you can dive deeper into the materials right here on this channel. Thank you for being here. I'm Ann Croker writing coach.